Hello, and welcome to the University of Washington Cardiometabolic Echo Session 13. I'm Nicole Earhart, one of the adult endocrinologists at the Diabetes Institute. And I'm really excited to welcome Jordana Cohen, an adult nephrologist who comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania and is a blood pressure and renal expert. She's gonna be talking to us today about pearls for resistant hypertension and management. Additionally, we have a great group of panelists today, including Gail bland Yununundi, who is an adult endocrinologist coming to us from Howard University in Washington, DC. We have Lorena Wright, also an adult endocrinologist and the director of our Diabetes Latinx Clinic. We have Anna Barash, our diabetes educator here at the University of Washington. And we have Savitha Subaranian, also an adult endocrinologist and our lipid expert. Additionally, we have Portia Hung, who is our clinical pharmacist, and we're excited to welcome Lumila Vidovitz, who's our social worker who comes to us from CMAR, one of our federally funded clinics, so she has a wealth of information to share with us. And we're also really excited to continue the patient voice part of our Diabetes Action Network and our Cardiometabolic Echo. So Fernando, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about living with diabetes and renal disease. Hi. My name is Fernando. I am patient of Dr. Lorena Wright, and I've been with diabetes since 2006. Being a Spanish, diabetes has been hard for me. The case and the, and the bread is practically gone now. And the doctor and the team have been helping me to have a better, healthy way to continue with the disease. At the beginning, I have a little trace of the proteins in the urine. The doctor had been helping me with medicines and practically is balanced in this moment, but it's hard to be a diabetic person. More in, in the way that the medicine is working here because the doctor want to do a lot of things and the insurance close everything. And they need to find a way to help us as a patient. And we have one question we wanted to ask you, you've got a cadre of health professionals in front of you. If you could tell them one or two things about living with your diabetes and cardiometabolic disease, what would you wanna share with them today? Well, the first that I always share with the doctors, be simple when you talk with us. Remember, I can talk about computers, whatever you want. And maybe you don't understand me. In the same way, I don't know you feel. You need to be talk very simple with us to try to understand because I've been with doctor, the express blah, 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 blah. What is that? We need to, as a patient, to have, have a link with our doctors in a way that we can understand them and they can understand what we feel with the disease because sometimes the diseases are no easy for, for a patient to deal with. That's where I, one of the things that I always told my doctor, be simple. Express yourself as I were a person that don't know nothing. So I'm excited to be talking to you today about by far my favorite topic, basically basics of hypertension, the things that we take for granted for the diagnosis and management of complex hypertension. And I'll do a bit of a focus on management in patients with living with chronic kidney disease. These are my disclosures. So the main goals of today's talk are to reinforce key competencies in hypertension diagnosis and management based on the most recent guidelines and evidence. I think we see a lot of hypertension and I think that it ends up getting sort of thrown up by the wayside compared to other issues that people are dealing with because it's often perceived as sort of being something that's simple to deal with. And I think there's a lot of elegant complexity to it that we can do better. And so I'll talk about that. I also hope that everybody can develop a practical approach to the evaluation and management of resistant hypertension and hypertension in patients with chronic kidney disease. So this figure is from a recent publication in JAMA from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. 
It demonstrates that blood pressure control in the US is declining over time. This has now been shown even further to be getting worse with COVID, and it's really an unacceptable trend. There are several factors that likely contribute to the decline in rates in blood pressure control and blood pressure management in the US. But first and foremost, physician inertia is a critical contributor and it's also the one that we as providers have the most control over. And so I'll spend today talking about some examples of the consequences of this inertia and proposing some potential areas that we can engage in as providers to try to reduce how these issues impact the care of our patients. First and foremost, blood pressure control, blood pressure goals. Current hypertension diagnostic thresholds, according to the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology 2017 guideline, recommend that when somebody is diagnosed with new hypertension, that that diagnosis is made when the blood pressure measured using a standardized approach to measurement. It's greater than, one, greater than or equal to 130 over 80 in most people except in those individuals who are truly low cardiovascular risk, less than 10% of, of a five-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, that in those individuals, we can push that to a diagnostic threshold of greater than or equal to 140 over 90. The new guidelines do typically recommend in most people with stage one hypertension, so low blood pressures that are not in a higher range greater than 140 or 150, that in those individuals, we can try lifestyle modifications first, but once you start getting to higher ranges of blood pressures, we recommend starting medications off the bat. Then once somebody hits that threshold and is started on therapy, their goal for treatment, no matter what their level of risk is, is a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. This has now been escalated a bit. For 2021, there's an international guideline clearinghouse from which we base all of our management of kidney disease, essentially, called KDGO. And they now recommend quite strongly that patients with chronic kidney disease, except those with kidney transplants, should be treated with a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120 in all comers using a standardized office blood pressure. And so I highlighted some key words here. This is based off of only individuals with CKD, so it's not recommended yet in the general population, but I suspect that this is sort of going, showing us what we're going to be seeing in the future of recommendations. That this goal of less than 120 is a truly stringent goal, but it's intended only when tolerated. So you do need to have that conversation with your patient and it's not meant to be a blanket goal for everybody. It's based on physician judgment being a key factor. And that another very critical aspect of this is that it has to involve standardized office blood pressure. And I'll go into what that means and why that's so important. So where did these guidelines come from? They're based off of largely the SPRINT trial, but there's now a lot of other supportive evidence besides the SPRINT trial that patients really benefit a great deal from lower blood pressures, much more so than they cause harm, which goes against, I think, a lot of people's intuitions. So the SPRINT trial, I think which most people are familiar with, but I'll review it just briefly, was a randomized control trial that randomized participants who were at least age 55 and older that had at least some kind of cardiovascular risk factor that they had an atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk of greater than 15% in the next five years of having an event. And that these individuals were randomized to either intensive blood pressure control with a goal of systolic blood pressure of less than 120 or standard blood pressure control with a goal of systolic blood pressure of less than 140. The study was stopped early after an average of 3.2 years of follow-up because there was such a marked difference in the benefit from intensive therapy from that less than 120 group compared to standard therapy balanced with really minimal adverse events, comparatively speaking, considering that benefit. And so people had a much, much lower risk of having major cardiac events, including myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiac death. A lot of people criticize SPRINT as not being generalizable to sort of a broader population, particularly not, involved, not the fact that it didn't include diabetic patients. There had been a previous trial called the ACCORD trial, which had a very, very similar design, but was also a factorial study, which wasn't just a blood pressure trial, but it was also a trial of glucose control. 
And in the individuals that had the more intensive glucose goal, those individuals tended to do worse. And there's concern that that might've muddied the water of the ACCORD trial in interpreting the blood pressure results. And so there's quite a bit of criticism of the ACCORD trial. Several post-hoc analyses have shown that many patients would still benefit from that lower blood pressure goal and that it was balanced with not substantial harm by the interpretation of the investigators. This is also now supported by the STEP trial, which was another study that also excluded diabetic patients. It was just in people without diabetes, but it was very similar to SPRINT, but looked in older individuals. The big criticism of SPRINT was that it might not be generalizable to a lot of our geriatric patients because there's concern of risk of fall and risk of harming patients from a lower blood pressure. The trial design was very similar, but this time instead of a goal of less than 130 of less than 120, the goal was to achieve an intensive blood pressure of 110 to less than 130. The, the achieved blood pressure in the end was very similar to the achieved blood pressure in the intensive arm of sprint. In sprint, the achieved blood pressure in the intensive arm was 122 millimeters of mercury, whereas in the STEP trial, the achieved intensive blood pressure was 126 millimeters of mercury. The study was also stopped early. This is gonna sound very familiar after an average of 3.3 years of follow-up because of such a substantial cardiac benefit in the intensive treatment arm. They found an absolute difference of about 1% of events. They found a relative re reduction of 25% lower risk of developing a major adverse cardiac event from this more intensive blood pressure goal. And there was really very minimal difference in adverse events across the groups. Those people in the intensive group had very similar rates of dizziness, of falls, of syncope. Really, the only difference was that in the intensive arm, there were more, more hypotension events, which are defined as a blood pressure of less than 110 systolic or a diastolic blood pressure of less than 50. But it wasn't associated with, with hospital admissions or related adverse effects. And so... I mentioned earlier, we have evidence supporting these lower blood pressure goals, particularly less, less than 130 because of an achieved blood pressure in the 120s. But it's really critical that these blood pressures be based off of standardized office measurements. And the reason for that is that there is a very big difference between clinic blood pressure measurements and typical research measurements. Research blood pressure measurements are typically performed in a very, very perfect environment. The patient's waiting for five minutes before the blood pressure is checked. It's the average of three readings. It's done in perfect positioning using an appropriate cuff that's validated, which I'll go through in more detail in the upcoming slides. Clinic blood pressures can be a smorgasbord of whatever you've got time for. Some clinics really do focus on it and do their best, but many clinics it's sort of thrown to the wayside along with other more important factors and it's done in a rush. And there used to be a perception that you could just add a correction factor to clinic blood pressures and that you could just assume what the actual blood pressure is. That if somebody comes into clinic, it's probably just a bit higher and that if we subtract it by eight millimeters of mercury, that was actually a number that was floating around for several years, that that would be the equivalent of what their research blood pressure would be. The problem is that was based on an average lower blood pressure in people for their clinic blood pressure versus their research quality blood pressure. But actually a friend of mine, Paul Draws, recently published a really fantastic study where he went and found, got as many electronic health record blood pressures as he could among participants of SPRINT and then compared them to what their closest research study blood pressures were. And what he found was that even though the average blood pressures were much higher in the clinic, it was all over the map. There were many people who had as much as a 40 millimeter mercury higher blood pressure in the clinic compared to their research quality blood pressure at a recent time point, and as much as 20 millimeters of mercury lower systolic blood pressure. And so if you added a correction factor to that, you could do a lot of harm to people. Those blood pressures are incredibly discordant and there isn't really any kind of rhyme or reason for why some people's blood pressures are higher or lower and by how much. And so we really can't just make assumptions. We need to be doing better quality blood pressures if we want to be treating our patients based off of any kind of evidence-based goal. And so what happens in the clinic that can contribute to why these numbers are all over the place? Well, some of it's on us. For example, if a cuff is too small, it can result in a blood pressure that's anywhere from 10 to 40 millimeters of mercury higher than what the actual blood pressure is. If it's too large, it can actually result in a lower blood pressure. 
If cuff is over clothing, of course, it can cause the blood pressure to both go up or down. And so, and just pushing the sleeve up the arm isn't a solution. And I think that's the most common approach to trying to do a blood pressure on a bare arm. And it creates a tourniquet effect. So you end up with decreased venous return and a very, very inaccurate blood pressure. Uh, I know as a five foot four woman, I can never ever have my feet reach the floor when I'm on an exam table. And I feel like that's the most common place to have your blood pressure checked in many offices. And so often you don't have your feet resting on the floor, your back is not supported and your arm is floating by your side. And all of these things are problematic. They all can impact blood pressure. Most of them increase blood pressure, which is why that average blood pressure in the office is higher than a research quality blood pressure but many of them also reduce blood pressure. There's also an issue with the devices that we use. There's been a transition in devices that we use to measure blood pressure over the past few, few decades. We used to perform blood pressure measurements in studies using mercury blood pressure devices. Those were the gold standard of how all of blood pressure is understood. Millimeters of mercury is based off of that. We had to transition to using different devices in the 90s due to the concern for toxicity of mercury, and these devices have slowly disappeared since that time, and now they're almost impossible to find. And so what we're left with were aneroid devices, which are used to perform manual blood pressures, and oscillometric devices, which were used to perform automated blood pressures. The aneroid devices, I think, are heuristically what most people think are the most accurate blood pressures, but they're truly not. There are a lot of issues with aneroid blood pressures because they actually are not as, as calibrated as a mercury device. They have these two small little springs inside of them that as soon as one of these devices gets, gets sort of jostled or if you slam against it or if it falls on the floor, they become dislodged and the device becomes miscalibrated. And just because the arrow points to zero when it's not being used doesn't tell you anything about how calibrated it is. So it's very problematic. These require very frequent rec recalibration and we often don't know what, what how accurate they are. We went through and checked our devices in our clinic against a mercury device and found that several of them were more than 10 millimeter meters of mercury off in either direction. So it's quite problematic and I think people don't realize that, not to mention all the human error components that I described on the previous slide. So that issue with the calibration is overcome with automated devices. Automated devices are really not prone to miscalibration easily. The most important thing though with automated devices is that they have to be validated. These devices work by sensing how, how blood pressure waves essentially travel through your blood vessels as the cuff squeezes on your arm. And it can measure that maximum amplitude it reaches is your mean arterial pressure. And the speed by which it gets to that mean arterial pressure can actually be used to calculate what the likely systolic and diastolic blood pressure is. So the mean arterial pressure is almost always accurate in these devices. The systolic and diastolic has to be determined based off of a population of individuals and then validated to make sure that the algorithm works. And, there, and we run into problems with that with quite a few devices. So it's quite important that you're sure that your device was validated before you use it. And I'll explain how to do that in subsequent slides. A major solution to the issues of quality of blood pressure measurement, taking that into account, is using what's done in trials and in, and in, in well-performed observational studies. It's using automated office blood pressure. And this is a special type of office blood pressure where you perform the average of three sequential readings in a row, or three uh, up, to, up to five actually. They often can force in a five minute rest, but you can bypass that if the person's already been sitting for a while. And they automatically calculate that average of multiple readings for you. These provide a much, much more accurate view of what somebody's blood pressure is. As I mentioned, it represents what it would be if they were actually in a research study. And it's very, very similar to what their out-of-office blood pressures would be based off of large studies that have looked at this. There are only two validated automated office blood pressure devices on the market, and I've shown them here. Taking into account the issues we have with blood pressure measurement, the USPSTF actually recommends that for the diagnosis of hypertension, we shouldn't just rely on office measurement. They, they actually have a grade A recommendation to use out of office measurements of blood pressure in order to diagnose hypertension. And the reason for this is that a lot of the limitations of in-office blood pressure are overcome by out-of-office measurement, particularly understanding discordant measures of blood pressure. What are discordant measures of blood pressure? These are things like white coat hypertension, 
and masked hypertension. White coat hypertension, I think we're all very familiar with. That's when somebody is a little nervous when they go to the doctor's office and their blood pressure tends to run higher in the doctor's office than it does outside of the doctor's office. Masked hypertension, on the other hand, is something I think less people actually hear about or learn about in medical school and in their training, and it often goes overlooked. Masked hypertension is a ticking time bomb. It's individuals who come into your office with a normal clinic blood pressure, but then all of the rest of the time at home, their blood pressure is elevated. This exists, this actually occurs in somewhere up to 25% of patients. It's most common in people with chronic kidney disease, in smokers, and in individuals with obstructive sleep apnea. It's also more common in men than in women. Masked hypertension is associated with as high of a cardiovascular risk as uncontrolled hypertension. This is an example of a, of a well-performed meta-analysis, which looked at studies that evaluate, evaluated people's blood pressure out of the office around the same time as they had an office blood pressure reading. And they found that people with mass hypertension with that normal office blood pressure reading and an elevated out-of-office blood pressure reading had a two-fold higher risk of developing a major cardiovascular risk in the subsequent years compared to individuals who had a normal or well-controlled blood pressure both in and out of the office. That is very similar to people who have sustained hypertension that's elevated both in and out of the office. White coat hypertension, interestingly, is not associated with much risk. Those individuals who are not yet on treatment and who have a high blood pressure in the office that's normal the rest of the time, do have a bit of an elevated risk. It's about a 36% higher risk of a major cardiac event, but that's actually related to the fact that these individuals are about a four to five fold higher risk of developing sustained hypertension in the five years after develop their diagnosis with white coat hypertension compared to people who are always normotensive. So individuals with white coat hypertension should not be treated for their office blood pressure, and it can be quite dangerous to treat them. It can cause a lot of unnecessary adverse effects from medication and costs from medication, but they should be monitored out of the office for transitioning to, to sustained hypertension. I think a lot of these people find out that they're white coat hypertensive. So every time they see the doctor, they just say, oh, I've got white coat hypertension. I don't need to be treated based on this blood pressure, but it's very important that we know what's happening outside of the office and that they haven't transitioned to sustained. If somebody is already on antihypertensive medication therapy, and our, we performed a meta-analysis looking at this, we observed that there was absolutely no difference in their risk of cardiovascular events. If they had white coat hypertension compared to people with well-controlled treated hypertension. I mentioned the importance of selecting the right blood pressure device when we perform these automated office measurements or home blood pressure measurements. It's very important to be aware that devices sold on the market are not all appropriate for measuring blood pressure in our patients, even if they say that they are FDA cleared. It's very interesting and sort of disturbing that the FDA does not approve most devices for patients, for patient use for blood pressure. They just clear them. Clearance is a very basic process that just involves demonstrating that devices are equivalent to a prior device. And what that means, equivalence, is up to the manufacturer to decide. There's no enforcement, there's no guideline for this. So the, the actual 510K clearance process by which devices get FDA cleared for blood pressure measurement does not require demonstrating any level of accuracy. The FDA treats blood pressure monitors about as seriously as they treat Band-Aids. They care that they're safe and that they won't cause harm to a patient, but they're not looking for accuracy. They don't consider an inaccurate blood pressure device something that would directly cause harm. Personally, I disagree with them. They also can't enforce prohibiting selling devices that are not valid or not cleared on the market. And so... From about 3,000 cuff-based blood pressure devices that are available on the market today, less than 15% have any published evidence on accuracy performance, and a lot of the published evidence is poorly performed and claims that devices are accurate, even though they're not. There are a couple of examples here of devices that are FDA cleared for blood pressure measurement that we do not recommend for clinical use. 
One example is cuffless blood pressure devices. There are a few now that are available on the market. This is an example of one that is FDA cleared to measure blood pressure. But in clinical attempts to assess the actual validity or the accuracy of the, these devices that weren't done by the manufacturer, people are finding that they can be wildly inaccurate and even seem like random number generators. And so I strongly recommend caution about using cuffless blood pressure devices for clinical use and checking with your patients about what devices they're saying that they use at home before letting them just going to use it because they might be using a device like this or some other cuff device that isn't actually accurate. Accurate. Kiosks are also problematic and really shouldn't be considered a reasonable way of performing out-of-office blood pressure measurement. They're often placed in very loud pharmacies where people don't have the ability to sit in correct positioning, where the cuff really can't appropriately size their arm and it sort of guesses what their arm size is. There are a lot of potential issues with these devices. There is only one validated kiosk and it's not the one that's most widely available. So I really strongly urge caution about using kiosks for blood pressure measurements. There are two websites available to find listings of uh, validated blood pressure devices. The first one I'm co-chair of, it's validatebp.org. It's led by the American Medical Association, and we started this a couple of years ago, where we review the validation studies of blood pressure devices available on the market that are submitted to us by the manufacturer. And they can be published or unpublished validation studies, because many of these studies are very hard to get journals to publish because journals don't think that they're very interesting. And and so we're willing to just review them as peer reviewers, even if they're not going to be published. And we do a very, very rigorous review process. And all of the members of the review committee are people who are very familiar with what's required for a device to really be used to measure blood pressure well. There's also an international site called www.stridebp.org that's run by the International Society of Hypertension. It's a bit more comprehensive because they review any validation study that's ever been published, so there are more devices there. They're a little less rigorous than we are, so that they're a bit more permissive, but it's a very, very good resource as a result of that because at least you have more options to choose from than our more, our more stringent list of, of uh, blood pressure devices. Next, I'm going to shift briefly to talk about the evaluation and management of, difficult, of, of patients with difficult to control hypertension. We know that hypertension affects almost half of U.S. adults, and about 20% of people with hypertension, so about 10% of U.S. adults, have something called treatment-resistant hypertension. And this is when your blood pressure is not adequately controlled on optimally dosed, tolerated dosing of three antihypertensive medications. Some definitions require that this includes a diuretic, but not all require it. Or that you're on a, minim a minimum of four antihypertensive medications to achieve adequate blood pressure control. It's often called apparent treatment-resistant hypertension because we can never know for sure if people are taking all of their medications unless we directly watch them take it or measure blood levels of medications, which are typically only done in research. So we often call it apparent treatment-resistant hypertension. This is associated with a much, much higher risk of cardiovascular mortality than, than having blood pressure control on less agents. And that's regardless of your degree of blood pressure control. So if I require if I require four agents to get myself to a blood pressure of 120 over 80, I am at much, much higher risk than my neighbor who might have a blood pressure of 120 over 80 on just two medications. When we think about managing resistant hypertension and difficult to control hypertension, we should be thinking about the highest tolerated doses of first line agents, which is often not done. This is based on very, very high quality randomized control evidence that showed that patients do best on these agents first. Everyone should be tried on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, a calcium channel blocker like amlodipine or nifedipine, and a thiazide or a thiazide-like diuretic first, unless there's an absolute contra contraindication to these agents. Once they've gotten on all three of those medications at the uh, highest tolerated dose they can be on without having side effects, we then work on maximizing their diuretic therapy. For instance, if they're on hydrochlorothiazide, we change them to chlorthalidone to have a more potent diuretic effect. Next, if they're still not adequately controlled, we add a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist or a potassium-sparing diuretic, examples like spironolactone and a plerinone. 
we should always do this before adding a beta blocker unless there's a specific indication for a beta blocker like atrial fibrillation or migraine headaches, or if there's a contraindication to mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist like elevated potassium. Usually this only happens though in advanced chronic kidney disease. We then recommend adding other agents after that. And this is all based on very high quality randomized control trial evidence in which people were randomized to in a crossover fashion to placebo, spironolactone, doxazosin, an alpha block blocker, and basoprolol, a beta blocker. And the authors found that spironolactone was by far superior to the other choices. There are several other similar studies that have shown that. In terms of not using a beta blocker for first or even fourth line antihypertensive therapy, there have been several studies that have shown that they can actually cause harm, probably due to their negative chronotropic effects. I'm so sorry, my light went off. And this is related to the fact that these just were never, they've been demonstrated in randomized trials to not be optimal first line agents as well. We had we have an example of an emulated trial that we performed that was published in hypertension a couple or last year, which showed that there was about a 70% higher risk of incident cardiac disease or heart failure in individuals who were treated with a beta blocker as their first line antihypertensive therapy who didn't have an absolute indication to be on one. So we usually recommend aiming for simplicity. Think about other things to help make the agents simpler to take and to make it easier for people to manage their difficult to control hypertension. Fixed dose combinations help a lot with this. I think people don't tend to like them sometimes because they take away our autonomy to adjust doses, but those small dose adjustments really do very little compared to the benefit of someone having an easier time taking their medication altogether. So I really push hard for fixed dose combinations and I've seen wonders achieved by changing people to them. We also recommend longer acting medications in favor of short acting medications. For example, for diuretics, chlorthalidone and torsamide go a very long way because they're both much, much longer acting than their counterparts like hydrochlorothiazide or furosemide. They both are once daily dosing, whereas, for example, furosemide is twice daily. It can be a big issue when people are not taking it appropriately or forget to take the second dose. We don't typically use minoxidil. I think people seem to think nephrologists love it. It's really problematic. I only used it in one patient and I regretted it because they came in with a pericardial effusion not long after because they weren't consistently taking their, their torsemide. Things to avoid are short, short acting medications. I never use hydralazine or clonidine unless there's another indication for their use. And again, less frequent dosing of short acting medications is incredibly problematic and does more harm than good for patients. In people with chronic kidney disease, it's really important to make sure that we really stress optimizing diuretic therapy. There's recent randomized control evidence to really support that. Many of these patients benefit from being on two and sometimes even three diuretics or to be placed on an SGLT2 inhibitor, which increasingly is really demonstrating to improve, to improve cardiovascular outcomes in our patients and renal outcomes. We tend similarly to what I just described to, to, to see benefit from using longer acting diuretics like chlorothalic thalidone and torsamide. And as I mentioned, it's often beneficial for these patients to be on more than one. I think there's another misnomer that people often think that people who have chronic kidney disease shouldn't be on an ACE inhibitor and ARB. And I don't know how that got out into the, the universe that that was ever an issue. We love having our patients on ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and we only stop them right before starting dialysis to help give people a little wiggle room before they start. So summary of challenges in hypertension ma management. Therapeutic inertia is a major driver of inadequate management of hypertension. And I think that it really is part of why we have declining blood pressure control in the US and that we can do better. If we trust the accuracy of our blood pressure readings, I think that that would be a huge aspect in overcoming inertia. And if we really trust using best evidence to manage blood pressure, I think we, can, we will do a much better job this isn't being done. Data show that really the majority of people probably aren't adhering to first-line therapies in treating patients. And so we really need to do better. Thank you so much for that great talk. And we already have a few questions in the chat for you. So I'm going to just going to read them out to you. One of the first questions that came up that got a few thumbs up was, what do you feel is the most effective medication for lowering systolic blood pressure when you have a normal diastolic blood pressure? Commonly seen, they said, in older adults. 
So that's a really great point. So a big issue in older adults particularly is that they often have low diastolic blood pressures and you don't want to lower the diastolic as much as the systolic, I agree. We don't have any medications that, that do not lower diastolic, meaning any antihypertensive medication we give is going to lower both systolic and diastolic. So when we have older people with very low diastolics, we have to think carefully about whether or not it's safe to escalate their antihypertensive therapy if their systolic is high and balance that risk and benefit because we can sometimes cause falls in people by bringing their diastolic too low, like less than 50. That said, calcium channel blockers like amlodipine and nifedipine, because of their vasodilatory effect, tend to lower diastolic blood pressure more than other first-line agents. So we tend to avoid amlodipine or nifedipine in people with very low diastolics, and we tend to favor ACE inhibitors or ARBs or diuretics in people with low diastolics because they tend to more evenly lower the systolic and diastolic. Thank you. That's a great point. So the next question is about beta blockers, because I think we all sort of know that they're very weak blood pressure agents, but a lot of times, as someone mentioned, they people come to us on beta blockers, and it's really hard to de-escalate or stop that therapy if you don't have all their records. So tell us a little bit about your experience and comfort in stopping the beta blocker. Do you do it commonly? And are there any hard, give us a quick list of hard nose to continue the beta blocker as well. Yeah, so I continue it if they've had a recent coronary artery disease event. I always check with the cardiologist before I would consider discontinuing it. And I continue it if they have a migraine, if they have a history of migraines and they're using it for prophylaxis. If they have a history of anxiety or particularly situational anxiety, it's really effective and somebody might have started it for that and then it fell off of their problem list. So it's a good question to always ask. And if they have a history of any kind of tachyarrhythmia, of course. I would never stop a beta blocker outright if they've been on it for a while. We do have to taper beta blockers off because they can have a rebound tachycardia. I do stop them quite frequently though. They, for instance, in people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which in my clinic is an increasing proportion of patients, there was a recent tri small trial in Jack that showed that actually being on the beta blocker can be harmful for these patients potentially. We see that it can reduce their aerobic capacity and that it can make them feel worse. They have a worse quality of life. And there's a whole like body of literature that's starting to look into this. We don't have conclusive evidence yet, but I think we're going to see more and more evidence supporting that they're harmful than that they're good and that we should be withdrawing them in a lot of people. I think just, I would never do it in somebody with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And as I mentioned, coronary artery disease and migraines. Great points there. And the atrial fibrillation arrhythmia yeah. for rate control, obviously, is that you already mentioned as well. Can you comment on, do you have any real world experience maybe to tell our primary care physicians who maybe don't have access to those higher quality blood pressure cuffs and are in their primary care clinics, like what they should do to make sure they're getting best quality blood pressure readings? Yeah, I would try to use automated devices in general. It doesn't have to be the fancy, like, the ones that automatically do three for you, but I would try to get at least two. No, don't just stick with one. What I often do is when, I, especially when I'm in a clinic room that doesn't have like our fancy device, because we only have them at six of them. And then we have like 30 clinic rooms. What I do is I talk to the patient, I get their history, and then I recheck a blood pressure. And it used to be that you would put them on the exam table and do that manual one. I keep them in the chair right by my desk so that their feet are flat on the floor, their back is supported. I don't do it on the exam table. And I use an automated device and I just, I hit it three times manually to get the result while I'm typing my note. Um, and so we've now had that five minute rest. We can get sort of simulate getting an automated blood pressure. You only need 30 seconds between readings to get as accurate of a reading as what they get in those fancy studies. So if you just did two of them 30 seconds apart, I think you're losing about a minute of your visit, which I know feels like a lot because our visits are so short on time, but I think it's worth it to get a second reading, not just compared to the triage reading, but two back to back in that office. Because you'll be surprised, especially the white coat patients. I see sometimes from the from the triage area, blood pressures that drop by 70 millimeters of mercury. And I just, I don't trust a triage blood pressure. I think there are just so many things that can go wrong, no matter how hard our MAs are trying. They just, they've got this checklist of 40 things they're trying to do in three minutes. And as much as our own visit it seem like they're packed. I think there's, their checklist is even more daunting. Great points there. Peter, go ahead and give us an update on the patient and Jessica, share your screen for us, please. 
So, okay, so this gentleman, just to review with everyone, he is a patient of mine. He's 55 years old. He is Spanish speaking from, grew up and lived most of his life in Mexico, but has been here for the past 20 years. He's planning to hopefully retire soon and go back to Mexico. Basically the initial concern, so he, he has several comorbidities. He has had type two diabetes for many years. And, but only more recently when I met him, he had been hospitalized for severe COVID and had been at that point on a lot of steroids and his A1C was quite high. And he, he was started on insulin and, and discharged from the hospital from that long hospitalization on insulin. And so he's now been on it quite long-term. He also has hypertensive heart disease, dyslipidemia. He has an elevated BMI. And during his, as a complication of his COVID, he did develop pulmonary fibrosis. And for that reason, he's, he's, continues to be on home oxygen. He also developed a pulmonary embolism during that hospital stay. So initially presented this gentleman's case because we were just having a lot of difficulty getting his, his blood sugar under better control, despite being on pretty high doses of his basal insulin and bolus mealtime dosing as well. So to go over his medications, he is on Lantus. You can kind of see the list there. And his usually he he takes 30 units. Lately, he's been taking 30 units. At Metformin, he is on 1,000 1, milligrams. It's BID. I'm sorry. I didn't update that part. Oh, oh, looks like looks like Nicole did. Thank you. So yeah, he's on Metformin twice a day. He's on Atorvastatin. He is still on Lasix every day, quite a high dose. He is uses his albuterol inhaler, takes aspirin low dose daily takes gabapentin. He is on, those are kind of his, he's on bisoprolol for part of his hypertension regimen. And he is also on Victoza now. That, that was kind of a new addition. And then he's, he gets Novolog 10 units with each meal. So three times a day for his, yeah, and his family history, heart failure and his mother and hypertension also in his mother going down to kind of his social history. He, he has now achieved, he has now has SSI. So that could be updated. So that's been a big victory there. And he is still married. He does not smoke. He does not drink currently, nor in the past. Here is his, if you go down a little bit more here, his are his kind of biometrics. So his weight is, he has achieved some weight loss since starting the Victosa from 135 kilograms down to 126 kilograms. And he also made some, some lifestyle changes with his diet. His BMI has improved from 30, 42 down to 39. There's his blood pressure. And then what's just really exciting now, the, the data table with his lab value. So his, his kind of random glucose number, 140s, that's what it was at a couple months ago. And But his from last year, it was in the 300s. But his A1C, as of today, he came into the clinic this morning just to get a lab draw, was 7.1, which is an improvement from 9.2 back in July. And prior to that, it was 11. So he's made a steady improvement in his, his blood glucose control. And really, it just feels like another victory for him. He's really happy about this and he can feel, he feels much better himself. So yeah, just really grateful that we got some advice through this, through his last presentation and he made the changes. He's worked really hard and yeah, been successful in that way. So we can go down a little bit, keep scrolling down. So he did have back last year when his A1C was quite high, his microalbumin to creatinine ratio was greater than 300. That was the point of care test that our lab uses. And it just cuts off at that above 300. And then that prompts us to get a quantitative, better quantitative level. And so it had been rechecked in April of this year when his blood sugar control was getting better and it was down to 39. And then a couple of days ago, he checked it again. And it was, we checked and it was 21. So that's been improving. And his LFTs remain normal. So there's some more lab data there. And then we can just go down. I think at this point, none of this other stuff has changed. We can go down to the last page, which is his kind of his food recall. He met with one of our RDs a couple of weeks ago and they kind of, up, we updated this. So the main change is I think he's been trying to re really control portion sizes with the nuts and also with dairy. And so He's doing just a quarter cup of nuts. He kind of varies them up, which type it is. He continues to have a smoothie in the morning, which the he and the RD talked about potentially eliminating that. And yeah, you can kind of just see what he has going on there. So not a big, not no big changes from his last, the last time we presented him. I think just in summary, we've made really good progress with his blood glucose control. And so now the question kind of comes up is what to do next? Do we expect this to continue to trend down? Can we start backing off on some of his insulin? Where would, where should we start with that? What, so 
that's pretty much it. Peter, that was a great summary and recap. Tell me now, what is his mobility? Like, can he walk in the house and get short of breath or is he walking half a mile? Yeah, no, he's, I mean, I mostly just see him in the clinic. I didn't ask him that specific question. I, I will say he's improved a lot since I think with the weight loss. When he's using his ox oxygen, he'll, he'll actually come to the clinic, visits a lot of times with the oxygen off. And he says he usually uses it when he's walking around more often. So just kind of day-to-day -day tasks, he's, his kind of exercise tolerance, I think has improved, but it's mostly when he's going out of the house, shopping and things like that, that he definitely more relies more on his oxygen. Great. That's great information. And then does anyone else have any clarifying questions for Peter? I do. Peter, that's great. It's such a successful story. Does he, does he check his blood sugars? Does he check in the morning or random? Any well, he, symptoms yeah. of hypoglycemia? No, unfortunately, he really just, he does check them, but just fasting, both myself and the, and his dietitian have coached him and encouraged him to start checking a couple more, at a couple more time points during the day or really related to meal times, but that's been an obstacle for him. So no, we just really have fasting data and then the A1C. And it looks like there's a question okay. from Anna. Mine's kind of piggybacking off of Dr. Wright's. I was wondering if there was any reported hypos or if maybe his family has seen that. Right. No, that hasn't been a problem for him. And I think that's a great point because the first thing we always want to do is avoid the low blood sugars or hypoglycemia. And then we want to work on the high blood sugars. So originally when we saw him, he had a BMI of 42, right? He was on about 60 units of insulin a day, but he was not on any of the insulin sparing agents that potentially had cardiovascular and renal protective effects. So that was sort of the focus of that first discussion. And Peter has done a great job in the sense that he added lorutatide and empagliflozin for both the cardiac protective and renal effects of the medications and hopefully to improve the glycemic management. And you saw all the great outcomes. He's now, his BMI is now 38. He normalized his microalbumin creatinine. He is now A1C, we just heard was 7.1. So that's great. So, you know, what, what is our next steps when we're talking about this case is? Well, there's always more learning in every case, right? So actually, when this case was sent to me, it was sent as he's still having an A1C of nine. We're worried about persistent hyperglycemia, right? And so a lot of times when patients come to us for the first time, we have very limited data. And so when I looked at him, I was like, oh, he's lost of almost 20 pounds. That's amazing. Do I believe this A1C, right? And then what was really remarkable, and again, it's just a random one value, but he went from a glucose of 345 to 141. And I was like, huh, I think he's had a remarkable change in his blood sugars over the last three months. And so that's the first thing we did is I, I, I touched base with Peter and I was like, hey, can we get some, do, do we have any finger stick data? Is there any way we can update it? And the patient was really willing to give us that extra data. And then we saw the additional concern, right? So basically what we want to do then is we want to talk about, well, what would happen to this patient if his A1C still really was nine? He's reporting fasting glucoses in the 180s to 200s still. How do we escalate the insulin or maximize his therapy? Or if it really is, as what has happened when we saw the values, how do we actually de-escalate him to sort of minimize that risk for hypoglycemia in the future. And so that's always what we're going to be asking. But you know, with ECHO, the first thing we always ask is, in the non-pharmacological area, what should we do first, right? And so I'm going to ask Anna to sort of weigh in a little bit about when you're talking about checking blood sugars, how would you counsel him so we would get enough information to see how he's doing from a blood sugar standpoint? Go ahead, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, this is hard for me because I don't know him socially a little bit. So I, I would be curious what his it looks like, and his meal times looked really late. He had like 8.30 for breakfast and 4 p.m. for lunch and then 8 p.m. for dinner. So fitting in where to get a finger stick would be very individualized and whether his family can help support him in a way. I mean, that sounds like it's been a challenge for you, Peter, <laughs> to get glucose. If a DEX, somebody had mentioned in the chat getting a DEXCOM on him, if that was an option, I would 
totally agree with that too. That's a great point. I definitely think that continuous glucose monitoring, because he does qualify given his insurance, would be an option. I think the other thing is, is not to overwhelm the patient with the finger stick. So if he could check every other day in the morning and then maybe pick before his dinner or before, two hours after his last food intake or at bedtime, and so he's only doing one or two finger sticks a day, you'll still get the sense of the patterns over time. And I think that would have been able enough information to let us know that his A1C was probably closer to seven with average blood sugars of 150 or less. But continuous glucose monitoring, he does qualify for because he's on three or more shots of insulin a day. The other thing I was thinking from a non-pharmacological intervention is he has this diagnosis of severe pulmonary fibrosis. He had that pulmonary embolism. He's on home oxygen. So I was going to ask the social worker, what do you think is his options for home physical therapy, given he's on home oxygen? And what options and how can we get some help with reconditioning for him, especially now that he's had weight loss and may be able to start to be more active? So there is multiple resources for that. Like there's a lot of nonprofit organizations. I have a like there's different ones that can come to the patient and it's pretty much them having to apply for that. And I have like a list of the resources if that's something that I can put in the messages, but they have like the assistance fund. And then there's like the Pounds, the Pans Foundation, a national organization for rare disorders. So there's a bunch of different like places that will do that for the patient. And it's also people that aren't covered with insurance as well. So that's something that could be really beneficial for him in particular. I hope that answers your question. And like under social security, right? The disability benefits is underneath that. So they do qualify for that as well, where someone can come in and do that and it's fully covered. Those are great resources. Yes. And if you want to chat them, that would be great. And then I'll ask you them to send them to me later and we'll put them in our community resource folder. So thank you for that. And then the piggyback, I was thinking about this with his history of COVID and the severe fibrosis after it. Tell us, have you started to see more resources available for people with complications with the long-term complications from COVID? And tell us a little bit about the CDP, based off the impacts of COVID-19, they provide support for ongoing health care needs, like access to care for the chronic conditions. They provide like all the accurate information on the vaccines and how to protect them, but mainly like the impacts of it. They provide things for the vulnerable population. So that's something that the World Health Organization did declare that. And so the CDP does provide that. That's something that's been super helpful and it's community-based and they provide any economic opportunity programs for the affected populations due to COVID. Great. Thank you for that information as well. It's great to see that we have resources available to help with people. And this is just a reminder, most of the time now, what's great is if you are on in intensive insulin therapy or three times a day, it is covered under our different Medicaid derivatives for in Washington state. And that it is only, and most of them you can send directly to the pharmacy and with a prior authorization, once you confirm that they're on more than three or shots of insulin a day, you can get them directly through the pharmacy. So he would be able to get his directly through the pharmacy. And then the next point I'm going to make is about his A1C goal, right? His A1C is seven. So 7.1. So would people say, I'm going to ask Gail this, do you think he's at goal or do you think we should push his A1C goal till six and a half? What, what do you think, Gail? Well, I think a 7.1 is good, considering all his risks and comorbidities. If he can get below 7, I mean, I think it's great, but I'm very happy to see how well he's done with the current one. I was just thinking about the SGLT2, if we wanted to put him on 25 versus the 10 that he's on, maybe that's something that can be done and see if we can get him under 7. But he's really made a remarkable change in terms of his diabetes control, so this is great. I agree that I think seven is a great goal for him because of his comorbidities, but that also because of his young age and because sometimes it helps us advocate for things like insulin sparing agents, such as a weekly GLP-1. If we really do feel that he could 
be a good candidate for a six and a half, you can document that. And then you can say that the patient's not at their goal, A1C, and you can move to alternative therapy that maybe will match maximize his weight loss, maximize his glycemic management. And so that's why in this particular case, I did say, I'd like to see him at an A1C of six and a half, because I think it will open up opportunities for him. So then the next clinical question was, is what would you do if your his A1C was still greater than nine, right? Because that was what we were really thinking when we first represented the case. And what would you do? And so Gail already sort of highlighted the first thing. So thank you, Gail, that we want to maximize what he's already on, right? So so we want to increase his sodium glucose co-transporter to 25, although we all know that the glycemic effect is fairly mild for that, but we do want to maximize all his therapies. And then when we're talking about maximizing the GLP-1 receptor agonist, and we're going to go into that into detail as well, you tend to get a little bit more bang for your buck with the weekly injectables. And this is what we need to highlight, right? Because knowing how to prescribe in our Medicare situation is three-fourths of the battle. So unfortunately, as we've talked about before, in our Washington State Medicaid, lorutatide and bieta or exanatide are our daily injections. And as we know, exanatide is twice a day injections. Both have to be tried and failed before you can request a weekly GLP-1, okay? So right now, this patient has been on lorutatide and is on maximum dose, but is not on his A1C goal. So Peter, if you want to move forward to try to get a, a weekly GLP-1, you will need to do a brief trial of exanatide. And so this is where I would tell the patient, it has to be timed to the meal. You want to give it 30 to 45 minutes before the meal. Let's do a trial for two to four weeks. And then you come back and tell me any barriers and we can potentially put in the prior authorization for the weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist. The other thing we can do once we advocate for the insulin sparing agents is escalate the insulin. And so what I want to show is, is that he was on a generalist dose of insulin. And you know that I'm a weight-based insulin management person. So I wanted to show you why I'd be comfortable with huge doses of insulin for him, right? I'm so glad he doesn't need it, but I always have in my mind, like, what dose do I think would be a large dose for him? And unfortunately, the dose that he's on right now at 30 and 30 at 60 units is only 0.45 units per kilogram, which to me is a very baby dose of insulin. Of course, I am a diabetologist, right? But I would think that once he's on one unit per kilogram or 120 units of insulin a day, that would be when I would think that he was on a really large dose of insulin. And remember, in these days, we like to see less background insulin. So maybe 40 units of, of his background insulin or once a day insulin shot. And I would be very comfortable up to 20, 25 units of prandial insulin especially in these people that are struggling more with their dietary intake. And he's made so many good changes. I mean, that is why, even though his BMI is 38, he needs, he has minimal insulin requirements. So you really need to give him kudos because he's very insulin resistant. The fact that he only needs less than 10 units with his meals to control his blood sugars is amazing, right? And so that's kudos to him. But this is just to show you what you want to do is just gain comfort with insulin, right? It's one of those things that is really challenging for people. And 100 pound person, you might say that 25 units of insulin is a lot of insulin, right? But for a over 200 pound person, a lot of times over 100 units of insulin is the appropriate dose, especially if they're not able to make those lifestyle modifications that really support them, or especially if they have a counterindication to some of our insulin sparing agents, which is another reason why he's on a lower cumulative dose of insulin and doing great. So the final thing is, is should, we want to try to reward him for doing so great. And I really, I think people do feel a reward if we're able to reduce the number of shots a day, if we're able to reduce the number of insulin. It's like positive reinforcement that they're doing everything right, right? And so that's, again, why we really want to try to get him on a weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist that Gail's going to talk about a little bit, the efficacy of the different ones and our new GLP GIP, as we've mentioned in other sessions. But you know, right now he's on about 60 units a day. So I do think he would be a good candidate, especially because he has two heavier meals. His breakfast and his later lunch at four tend to look a little heavier than his like evening meal. So I might try him on somewhere between 25 and 30 of the 70-30 mix 
insulin, which would only be 21 of background insulin and nine of the mealtime insulin. You can always creep back up on it if he's having a little higher blood sugars, but you're going to, you get that weekly GLP-1 and you get them down to two shots a day, he's down from four shots a day. And I think people really get validated by that. And I think you, you might have a good chance of having good control with him. Again, if, if the number of shots a day isn't something that motivates him and he's very comfortable or he has stockpiled his insulin, I still would go down a little bit on the background insulin to 28 units. And like I said, because it looks like right now his evening meal or last meal of the day is his lighter meal, I'd probably go down by one unit on it and maybe get some bedtime sugars just to make sure that that is well controlled. And again, this is where the continuous glucose monitoring would really help you to see what's going on overnight and his post meals without him having to burden himself with all the pricking of his fingers. The other point that I wanted to make before I turned it over to Gail was that we do this a lot, I think, where we say, if you're less than 100 in the morning, take 30 units of insulin. If you're greater than 100, take 34 units of insulin. So, you know, basal insulin is supposed to be sort of your steady state insulin. And so what I tell people is it's not something you change on an every day based on one blood sugar. It's a pattern, right? And you want to pick that basal insulin or background insulin based on what your averages are primarily focusing on not having any any sugars less than 70 or too tightly controlled in the morning. And so one thing that I would recommend maybe in this patient is you can give him a simple way of de-escalating his insulin so that if he has two morning sugars in a row greater than less than 100 or any that are less than 70, you go down by three to five units of insulin. And it's a little bit of gestalt, but a lot of times if they're on less than 40 units of basal insulin a day, I'll use three. If they're on a higher dose of insulin a day, like 40, 50, 60, I'll go down by five. And for someone who's on 20 or 30 units of insulin, I might just reduce it by two so that you get a small decrease, but you give them a simple pattern. So then they haven't had two tightly controlled blood sugars over three months, because that's when you've been able to get in and, and see them, but they have an easy way of de-escalating. Remember the background insulin doesn't help us lose weight, right? So the more insulin they go down on, the more their potential to continue those healthy lifestyles and have even more weight loss. So, and so this was just part of the reason why we advocate for the weekly GLP-1 as you can see, are some glutatide when you look at these meta-analysis for weight loss for all the different classes of medications available. And within the class, it tends to be the, the best medication for weight loss. So Gail, would you go ahead and take it away for us now? In terms of managing, in terms of diabetes, and we have a plethora of drugs, but I think some of the drugs that really have basically changed our treatment paradigm has been the GLP-1 agonist and the SGLT-2s. And these are drugs that really, I think, have really made a difference in terms of how we are able to manage and control the hyperglycemia in our patients. So I'm going to focus on the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And next slide. So I have here ranked from the highest to the lowest, and we have the new class, which is the GIP, GLP-1, terzepatide, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, followed by the semaglutide, which has the next potency in terms of lowering A1C, followed by the oral semaglutide, and then the dulaglutide and liraglutide have about the same in terms of A1C lowering, followed by the exenatide XR, and then the final one is the daily exenatide. Okay, next slide. Weight loss. That's another thing about the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which makes it a great drug. It is, is the weight loss. And the new class on the market is the tizarapide, followed by the semaglutide, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and the exenatide, either the weekly one or the daily one is the least in terms of weight loss. Let me go into the tizarapide. It's the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the GIP, or which we call the glucose-dependent insulotropic polypeptide. And it works in terms of improving the insulin sensitivity at the adipose level. It also affects the central nervous system in terms of decreased food uptake, in terms of increased satiety. And then it improves in terms of the insulin secretion at the pancreas. And it also can work as a decrease in glucagon secretion. However, it does have another role in terms of the GIP. It will increase glucagon secretion at, when the patient is hypoglycemia. So it has that dual effect on glucagon. And it has the delayed gastric emptying. 
And so really it works very well in terms of managing diabetes and the adult with type 2 diabetes in terms of increasing insulin, decreasing glucagon, decreasing the gastric MDN, decreasing the hyperglycemia, and the increase in sensitivity. In terms of the trial, and they've had five trials in terms of surpass one through five. The first one was the monotherapy. And when we look at terzerapide, we're looking at three doses. It's the five, the 10, and the 15 milligrams. And the 15 milligrams is actually the most potent one. And we have seen significant A1C reduction in terms of as monotherapy. And you can see as much as 2.8 A1C reduction with that. And they compared it and surpassed two with semaglutide, one milligram. And we know that we have now two milligrams, but when the study was done, it was with the one milligram of the semaglutide. And again, we saw a more robust A1C reduction when compared to the semaglutide. And then the surpass three was in the background, either with metformin or SGLT2 as the medications. And again, comparing terzotopide to those that we saw a significant reduction in A1C, as much as almost 2.8. And then the surpass four was really the ones that had the cardiovascular component disease. And that we saw, again, significant reduction in terms of A1C compared to either patients on metformin, an SGLT or a sulfonylurea. And then the surpass six is the metformin or insulin glargine. And again, we saw great reduction. Now, section B is looking at patients where we can get them below 7% and almost 90, over 90% of patients are able to get to less than 7% with the terzepatide compared to the standard control doses that they were using, using either semaglutide, either metformin SGLT2, metformin SGLT2 or sulfonylurea, or insulin glargine, and also the insulin dulaglutide. And then C is looking at getting them below 6.5%. And you have a significant number of patients who can get below 6.5%, which can be as much as 80 or 85% of the individuals using terzepatide insulin compared to the competitors or comparators that they were using in the particular studies. And section D, which is even more remarkable, um, up to 40, 45% could get their A1Cs below 5.7 using this particular medication, particularly when you reach the 15 milligram dose. So this seems to be a really remarkable drug that has come on the market, I believe, since about July 2022. And it looks like it's a very promising drug, a very potent drug in terms of A1C reduction. So the benefits of this particular medications include at least an A1C at 2.3%. Weight reduction is between 10 to 15%. And it almost reaches the bariatric surgery weight loss of about 20%. You saw a reduction in systolic blood pressure of 6.5 millimeters of mercury, diastolic blood pressure 2.9 on average. Triglycerides reductions were 19%. HDL increased by 6.8%. LDL reduction by 5.2%, and you saw a decrease in visceral and subcutaneous opacity. And it also benefited in terms of decreased waist circumference of 6.9 centimeters. The adverse effect mainly was GI disturbances, diarrhea, bloating, vomiting. You saw more with that, but it was not significant enough where patients, the majority of the patients couldn't tolerate it. And it was more with the higher dose, but it seems to be a very, very good drug. And even now they're looking at it in other avenues like NASH, that they're seeing promise in terms of reducing non it fatty liver disease. So that is something else that we're going to see in future studies. I have here in this slide in terms of what was published in the JAMA Health and 2021 in terms of the health disparities related to the use of GLP-1 agonists. And, and what we have 
noticed is that it is not offered as much in individuals, Hispanics, Asians, as well as African Americans over the course of years that they have been looking at this. And some of the barriers that I hear about some of this, and particularly when we're looking at those more potent GLP-1 agonists, and many times we have to use those that may not be as potent in terms of the metabolic changes that we're looking for in terms of weight and A1C. This is a health disparity issue and really would like to see that all patients can be offered these particular agents because they're really great in terms of what I can see as managing our diabetic patients. So this was a study that was done over the past five years, concluded in 2019, and hopefully it's better right now, but this did demonstrate that many of the patients did not receive the DLP-1 agonists that were so beneficial in the management of their diabetes. So Nicole has asked me to talk something about steroids. That is something that is very, very very difficult in terms of management, particularly like our COPD patients, and they get those bursts of steroids, and then we're dealing with elevated blood glucoses or our orthopedic patients who get an injection in their knee, then we're seeing these high blood sugars. And we have to understand the mechanisms of actions, the timing of the glucocorticoids. We don't really see much in the way of a short-acting glucocorticoid hydrocortisone, but the intermediate ones like the prednisone or the long-acting dexamethasone, those are the ones that are probably the most problematic. And so when you're looking at the peak onset of action, a prednisone, eight hours, and it can last for 12 to 16 hours. And its effect is basically blocking the insulin effect of, and you're seeing the hyperglycemia, and it's sort of antagonistic to insulin. Then you're seeing these hyperglycemic episodes. So one of the things that I thought was an easy way to remember how much to give, because MPH works well in terms of its timing, its onset of action, its peak action, and its duration, that using a weight-based method is one of the simplest ones that I can remember. So if the patient is on 10 milligrams of prednisone a day, is given in the morning, you can get 0.1 unit per kilo of MPH. If they're on 20 milligrams of prednisone a day, 0.2 units per kg of MPH, and then 30 milligrams, then 0.3. And you can also add correctional rapid acting insulin for preprandial doses. So if the blood sugars is 200 to 300, you can get 0.04 international units per kg preprandial. And then if their blood sugars are running greater than 300, then 0.08 international units per kg for preprandial values. And then, of course, you monitor them on a, every two to three days and make adjustments accordingly. 10% increase in terms of blood sugars, I mean, of MPH, if their blood sugars are consistently running above the 300 mark. What about the long-acting glucocorticoids, dexamethasone? And during that COVID times when we were giving dexamethasone, we were seeing elevated blood glucoses. And so we can try MPH, but we would give it in divided doses, starting at 0.3 units per kg of MPH divided, where two-thirds are given in the morning or one-third in the evening. Or you can actually use a long-acting insulin glargine, the U100, U300, or the insulin deluglutac at 0.2 units per kg. And again, adjust your doses of insulin every two to three days, about 10% until you can achieve the goal. So the challenges with steroid is, again, then they're tapered, and then you're going to have to adjust your insulin even further in terms of decreasing the amount of insulin. So it is a challenge, but this is something that can be used as a guide when a patient is put on steroids. U500 regular insulin. So if the patient is on more than 200 units of insulin per day, I start thinking about using the U500 regular insulin. And so we, if they're on between a total daily dose of 150 to 300 units, I can use a twice a day injection regimen, either giving 60% of it in the morning, 40% at dinner time, or you can do a TID dose of 40% at breakfast, 30% at dinner, and 30% at bedtime. Or you can do TID, again, if they're between 300 to 600 units, and then dividing it again, 40, 30, 30. And then the total daily dose of greater than 600 units, then they're going to need QID injections of evenly divided 25% each.
And one of the things when you use U500 regular insulin, you have to be careful, particularly if you use a vial and syringe. And our typical syringe, the orange colored ones are the U100 insulin syringes. And because the U500 is five times more potent, then you have to divide the units of insulin that the patient would be on by five when you draw it up in a regular orange uh, ran. So if they were on 100 units of insulin a day and you gave them the U500 dose, then that would be 20 on that particular syringe. So, and that becomes, becomes problematic because people have to use the math. Preferably, if you can, you can get the pan where it is calibrated. So if they needed 100 units of, of the U500, you just dial up to that dose, or let's say they needed 50 units or whatever, you would dial that particular dose. Then also you should be aware that they do have the U500 syringes that are calibrated and those are the green color. And then if you could provide that for your patient, then they do not have to do the particular math. Thank you very much, Gail. And what I wanted to do was I really wanted you to highlight the terzipatide, Mongero, and the weekly GLP-1s because we do want to advocate for them. And that's exactly what you showed is that they're really efficacious. There's high efficacy, but there's low penetrance in our most vulnerable population. So thank you for doing that. And Portia, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like for the GIP, GLP, terzipatide, it's the same criteria. So as long as they failed a lorutatide and bieta, we can put in a prior authorization for terzepatide. And with this person with a BMI that was initially 42, now 38, I think this would be a perfect person to advocate for our new GIP, GLP. Or if we can't get that, then a weekly GLP one receptor agonist as the next step. And then what we also want to say is what are, can be barriers? Where What ha can happen if he's doing well from a diabetes standpoint? Well, the first thing I thought of is, was the steroids, right? If he ends up, his pulmonary fibrosis gets worse, if he ends up getting an infection, he's probably going to need steroid bursts. So I wanted Gail just to go over some techniques of how you could escalate or initiate appropriate insulin, which typically is NPH insulin rather than our 24-hour insulin to sort of match that prednisone peak. And then the final thing is, is because we're the cardiometabolic echo, I wanted our lipid expert to sort of weigh in about what she thought was going on with his lipids. So go ahead, Savita. So Dr. Erhardt wanted me to discuss a few points about his general lipid panel and what does insulin do to triglycerides? And then she had a question on use of fish oil. So I'll try to keep this brief. So the first thing is what does insulin do to triglycerides and what happens in diabetes? So if you want to hit the next button, please. So in general, something to keep in mind is you cannot separate the triglycerides and the diabetes. Insulin actually decreases triglyceride levels. So if you have well-managed diabetes, the triglycerides may be in a reasonable range. And the reason for this is how triglycerides are taken away from the circulation is through this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that hangs out in the capillaries. And so when you, when the triglycerides pass through the circulation, the LPL acts on the triglycerides and helps it get stored in fat or burnt by your muscle. Now, when you have enough insulin and you do not have insulin resistance, insulin stimulates the LPL activity. And so the triglycerides are nicely removed from the circulation. If you have insulin resistance or you're very hyperglycopation is hyperglycemic, what happens is there is the LPL activity is inhibited. And so you have high triglycerides. So you may have patients in your panel that have very high blood sugars and their triglycerides may be 500, 700, 1000 even sometimes. And the reason, and so if you take care of the diabetes, the triglycerides will actually come down. So the reason for that is the effect of insulin um, on LPL activity. And so when you have hyperglycemia, there's not enough insulin in the circulation. So triglycerides remain high. Next slide. So the other important thing that you will come across in your practice, and you should be able to identify is, is to understand when to measure lipids when somebody is losing weight. When you lose weight, weight loss actually decreases all lipid variables. Everything comes down. Active weight loss will decrease 
total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, HDL, all the different variables you see in a lipid panel. So that's very important to know. So if you have an outlier, if you had lipids that were a certain way when they were not losing weight, and then they're now actively losing weight, and everything's significantly improved, you want to keep in mind that's not their baseline. So in active waist, weight loss, there is a drop in HDL cholesterol, and it could be the reason why this gentleman who had a reasonable HDL before, presumably, is now at 29. So you want to always make sure they're weight neutral or their weight has plateaued for about three to six months before you reassess their lipids. Interestingly, Dr. Nanli Bland showed you the lipid effects of terzepatide, the twin critin, GLP, GIP1 analog. There was a decrease in all lipid parameters. And the reason for that is likely the weight loss. So, so just keep that in mind. And so, as I mentioned, check the lipid panel when weight is stable. Fish oils, I'll go through this pretty quickly. This is a question that gets asked all the time, especially in people with diabetes who have triglycerides that are 160, 180, 200. Do these people need fish oil? So fish oil in general, lower triglycerides by about 15 to 50%. It's very variable. And the reason why fish oil is still talked about is because in populations where people consume a lot of fish, there's longevity, very low heart disease risk. And that's where the, these came from observational studies. There are two versions of fish oil. Fish oil in general, omega-3 from the marine source has two versions. One is EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, and the other is DHA or docosapentaenoic acid. It all depends on the double bond positioning, as you can see on the right of your screen. And over-the-counter supplements have a combination of EPA plus DHA. And nowadays you get an EPA alone version also. And in prescription forms, you get both. You get the, the omega-3 mixtures, that's EPA plus DHA, that's branded either Omacor or Lovasa, you may be familiar, or EPA only, which is purified EPA, which is sold as vast. The over-the-counter supplements have wide variety of purities. The content of the EPA and DHA is extremely variable and so is not recommended based on existing data. And there's lots of environmental concerns because of the way the fish are harvested. The fish from where you get the EPA and DHA are bottom feeders. And so when a lot of harvesting of these fish oils happens, it actually upsets the ecosystem. So the next slide is to highlight the effect of EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid it only that is purified they have sold as vasipa so the reduced study is the one which brought this into the limelight the key thing is there was no benefit from fish oil mixtures with combination therapy in any of the trials until 2019. So there was no cardiovascular benefit. But when Reducid came along in 2019, using just eicosapentaenoic acid, this looked at people with diabetes and one other risk factor, or people who had heart disease, there was a significant cardiovascular benefit, which affected all populations with or without diabetes. And the key thing to understand here is these were people who were treated already with statins and actually had very good LDL cholesterol and their baseline triglycerides were 135 to 499. So moderate, mild to moderate hypertriglyceridemia. And on the right side, you will see the figure for the primary cardiovascular endpoint, which showed a significant decrease in five point mace, the cardiovascular outcomes that are usually studied in these, in these large trials. So next slide. The, so the, you want to go back? The benefit of, of Vasipa or eicosapentethyl is not believed to be just from triglyceride lowering because the triglycerides only lowered by about 10% at the most. And it's probably explained by maybe membrane stabilization or anti-inflammatory effects or other anti-thrombotic effects. So beyond the metabolic effects of just triglyceride lowering. But and on the other hand, I want to point this out to you. This is the STRENGTH trial, which came out the following year, one year after the Reducid was published. This looked at combination EPA and DHA, so omega-3 carboxylic acid. This is sold as Omacor. And this study was completely negative for cardiovascular endpoints, and the trial was stopped due to futility in early January, two months after the Reducid was published. And that's all Thank I have. Thank you, Savita. We've covered blood pressure, weight, diabetes, and cholesterol today. So a true cardiometabolic echo. So thank you for attending session 13 of the cardiometabolic echo. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.